Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our Matthew Bible study. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 13 today. We covered some of that last week. Hope you'll look for that lesson online. This is going to be the second part of the kingdom parables as we looked at Jesus as king, and he's kind of explaining that kingdom. You can find a worksheet if you go to www.oldunioncoc.com, and there under the lesson and sermons tab, uh, you'll find this video, and right beside it will be a worksheet that you can print out and follow along if you would like to. So, the kingdom of heaven is like. Jesus has been talking about this kingdom. He's been talking about king. We've been looking at kingly character, kingdom and conflict, and now he's going to talk about the kingdom. Notice he uses is like. It's not exactly. He's using parables to teach. 13 of the 43 parables are about the kingdom. So why the parables? Well, last week we looked. It was necessary to teach. Uh, it's so that certain things could be hidden. Yes, parables are sometimes told so that not everybody understands all the meaning. We're going to see that again today and that the kingdom was evolving. Slowly, people were beginning to understand it and learn about it. So what was a parable? Well, it is the placing of two or more objects together in order to compare them. It is a comparison. Maybe it is a comparable, right? Uh, you take something of a spiritual nature and of an earthly nature, and you set them beside each other to better understand. The word parable means to lay alongside. There are 13 kingdom parables. Five of them are agricultural. Four have to do with money. Two are about feast. One is about fishing. Uh, I know somebody will probably like that out there in the congregation. And one is about cooking. So, again, why those parables? To teach, but yet to hide. So let's work into it today. Last week, we looked at the parable of the sower. And in looking at the parable of the sower, we've got to remember there are basic rules of interpretation. As we look at a parable, You've got to look for spiritual truth. What, what caused him to have to tell the parable? Who is his audience? Well, what was he trying to say? Don't oversimplify a parable and say, oh, that was just a story. And don't overcomplicate a parable and say, oh, we're going to get into every little detail and we're going to expand that out. Parables illustrate truth, but do not prove truth. It is the word that proves truth. Uh, a parable helps to illustrate. Uh, often speakers give illustrations. And if you take those too far out, it, it destroys the point. The idea was for you to kind of remember it uh, and then go and, and work on that. Draw the conclusions that the parable draws before drawing your own. What is the parable about? Last week, I challenged you to read ahead and to see what were the parables we're going to look at today about? What does the scripture say about them? Not a sermon you've heard before, not what you think, not what you looked up. What does it say right there? And Jesus and his parables are one. He's teaching about his kingdom. So last week we looked at the parable of the sower. Remember, he was planting by this broadcasting method. He was throwing seed out. And so he sometime was on the roadside and the birds got it and stony ground and the sun came up and there was competition among the thorns and there was good soil. And then remember, th th there's a pause there. And later, Jesus interprets it for the disciples, not the whole group. So kind of watch for that. Does he interpret or does he just tell the story? So he goes on to say that the seed is the word, uh, that the soil is different receptions of that word. He talks about what the roadside is, what the birds are, what the soil over the bedrock is, what the thorns are, and what good soil is. He goes on to explain the story. So here are the parables. We've looked at the sower in Matthew 13. We're going to look at three today. The wheat and the tares, or the wheat and the weeds, we might call it today. The mustard seed and the leaven. Next week, we'll probably look at the other three. So let's get started today. Now, were all of them interpreted? I, I had a little chart on last week's worksheet and asked you to read ahead. And were they interpreted or were they just told? And you were supposed to circle yes or no. We'll kind of update that worksheet as we go on. So... When we look at this story, Matthew chapter 13, beginning verse 24, another parable, remember he's already told, another parable he put forth to them saying, 
the kingdom of heaven is like. There's that phrase again, right? It's like something. A man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, do you not, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? They begin to question that the seed, right? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us to go out and gather them up? Notice there's a question here. We're going to come back to that question. But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Jesus is telling a story. He's telling a story about the planting of a crop. Again, an agricultural parable. He says some people go out, and what happens in the story? Well, basically it is this. A man goes out to sow some seed, right? It was supposed to be good seed. But while he slept, the enemy comes in and plants weeds. And as it begins to grow, it's obvious that there is a two crops growing in the same place. His workers had fallen asleep, right? And they asked, do you want us to go out and do you want us to uproot those weeds? And the owner says, no, no, let them grow into harvest. That's the story. That's the story. That's the parable. There will be a time of separation. There will be a time that these two products will be one goes one way and one goes the other. So, what about the explanation? There isn't one right there. There isn't one right now. I know some of you have read ahead. Calm down. There isn't one right there. It's a story about planting and about how seed became corrupted because of someone else's um, addition. So that's the wheat and the tares. And then he goes into another story. Are you with me? Follow along. Another parable he put forth to them saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. He tells a story about a seed that becomes a tree. Many of you have probably heard a sermon, or maybe you've even looked up a mustard seed. There you can see one on your screen in between the, the thumb and the, and the forefinger, the index finger there, of, of a person, and it's very tiny but it grows into a tree. Now remember, we don't have mustard trees around here. That's not what grows. And so let me put it in their minds. Let's put it in the mind of the people who hear. The mustard seed, very tiny. But this is what it can become. I want you to really look at this picture for a moment. I need you to see there are goats in that picture. They're almost dead center. There are buildings now look at the size of the tree. All of that came out of a mustard seed. Wow. And that was the story he told. And then he moves on to another story. Another parable he spoke to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. This is a baking story, right? This is a cooking story. This is about making bread and, and how you put leaven in it to rise. So what are the stories here? Well, they're basically things that the people would have recognized in their daily life, that they would have seen a mustard seed. They would have seen a mustard tree. Both of them were rather common in the New Testament times, people baking bread, right? Some of you may have tried that in this quarantine. The mustard seed there is very small, uh, but again, I showed you what it can become. When it's large enough, it would attract birds. And you can imagine the tree that I showed you. It definitely would have attracted birds, right? Uh, what about leaven? Well, 
You use it to make bread, right? You use it to make the bread rise. This would have been a common thing that they would have dealt with. Most of us just buy our bread pre-made and pre-sliced, right? Greatest thing since sliced bread. You ever wonder what was the thing before sliced bread? Um, you take the dough, you put the little leaven in it, and it affects it. So, then he goes on. Notice so far, he's told three stories. A lot of what you know, a lot of what you're thinking, are things you've heard when people have stopped to explain them. Or, or like I just did, showed you a picture of a mustard seed or, or of a mustard tree. Jesus stops and does no explanation so far. He tells three stories in a row, and then he says this thing again about parables. Are you with me? He says he does it because of prophecy. All these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables, laid them down beside each other. And without a parable, he did not speak to them. I wonder how you would feel if I got up one Sunday morning and only gave a lesson of illustrations. No scripture, just illustrations. Well, that's what Jesus does here. When he speaks to this crowd, he just gives illustrations. He is not quoting from the Old Testament. He is not uh, telling what it's like in heaven from personal experience. He tells three stories. All these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables, and without a parable he did not speak to them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. Why does he do parables? It was prophesied he would speak that way. It was prophesied that they would, they would hear that way. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things kept in secret from the foundation of the world. What is Jesus doing? He is taking things that would be very hard for them to understand and telling a story to help them understand, like the kingdom of heaven is like. Let me explain it to you. Now, are you ready to switch gears for just a moment? Then Jesus sent the multitude away. He tells three stories, and they go away. He sends them away, and went into the house. Do you see what happens next? And his disciples came to him, saying, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. Notice Jesus had not explained it. He had just told it. And now the disciples, I'm guessing, had had some kind of conversation with themselves, and they were saying, we kind of talked this over, and we're not sure we got it. Maybe they got the mustard seed, right? But that's kind of a, an easy story, right? You plant a seed, a tree grows. They, they got the bread, right? You put the leaven in, the bread rises. What was the story about the wheat and the tares? And at the end of that story, there was some kind of separation and, and burning and gathering. I wonder who us is in that. You know, I would like to know who had said this. Was it one of the disciples who uh, thought he knew? And so he went in and said, oh, we've been talking about this and, and tell us that so that he could say, ah, look, I, I, was right, I was right on that. Was it a couple of them speaking for the group and the rest of the group saying, we, we haven't been talking about this? He answered and said to them, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. Now, Jesus just drops a bombshell here. Jesus is telling them something that he has not told the multitudes. He's telling the disciples. He uses a term, the son of man. It is a scriptural term from the Old Testament, meaning a Messiah. He does not say king. You see, king is a politically charged word. If he had said, um, I'm telling you these things, right? I'm telling you these things, go back, because the one who sows the good seed is the king. That immediately would have brought different ideas into their head. Understand their version of king was King Herod or, or the Caesar, and Jesus uses the son of man because it had not become a politically charged term. You know, as soon as I today, and I'm a teacher of American government as a part of my American history class and as a side class in the school system, as soon as I use certain words 
they are politically charged. When I say a certain form of a philosophy, political philosophy, immediately some people shut down because they think they know what that is and they don't want to hear it. Some people open up because they want to know more about it. And some people are somewhere in between. Jesus uses son of man so they don't shut their minds or open them too large. That that they're what do you mean, son of man? Well, where do we find that? Well, we find it in Daniel chapter seven. He kind of makes reference to this remark that Daniel says in Daniel chapter 7. I'm just going to read it here, and then we're going to kind of move on. But I want you to know Jesus has kind of said, hey, you know who the one sowing the seed is? It's the Messiah. Jesus has just kind of dropped a bombshell here. Here's what Daniel 7, 13 and 14 says. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and he brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. The Son of Man would have a kingdom. That all peoples, plural, nations, plural, and languages, plural, should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, eternal, right? Which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Jesus has said in that story, the one who has come to sow the seed is this. It is this. It is the Son of Man who is going to have an eternal kingdom. Then, he goes on to explain the story, not to the multitude, to the disciples who've come to ask. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. So the seeds, they represent two different things depending on whether they're wheat or weeds. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are the angels. Jesus spends some time here, and he says, here's who the people in the story are. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man, the King, will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness. Please notice, he is going to send these out. It is not the worker's job to weed the garden. D did you hear that? It's not the worker's job. The angels will do that at the end. I think that's very important. You see, we believe, and, and this is where the like thing is, we understand that a seed becomes what it's supposed to be. But those of us who are in the kingdom know that weeds can be turned into wheat and tares can be turned into wheat. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, I know that's not true in the botany world, the biological world, right? If we go around ripping out the people we think don't belong, what does the scripture say? We may pull out that which does belong because we can't tell the difference. How many of you have been wheat and weeds, depending on where you were in your walk with God? And if someone had come in and decided which one you were at that moment, they may have ripped you out and decided you weren't worthy. That is not who our God serves, or that's not who we serve. That's not who our God is. You see, I think so many times we think it's our job to do the weeding. I think we have to be careful in this parable because Jesus says some of those things are going to grow up at the same time. Why doesn't God just take evil out of the world? Because this isn't the final place. This isn't, our, our, this isn't the eternal kingdom. This is an earthly place. Well, why doesn't God just take all hypocrites out of the church? Well, because probably you may have been taken out at some time. Have you always lived for God? Have you always, your words and your actions matched the word? He says, there'll come a time that that will be done, but, but I will determine that time. And then we, me and the angels, 
will take up the things and decide which pile they go in. You know, if I came into your house and I started just picking things and we had a trash pile and a treasure pile, I might find something in your house that to me is just trash. I mean, it's a piece of paper with some crayon markings on it and and maybe a, a handprint that has been uh, drawn around. And I think that's just a silly piece of paper. But to you, it's the first art project your, ever, your child ever brought home from school. To you, it's a treasure. To you, it goes in the treasure. I don't understand the meaning behind it. You know, there are people in the kingdom. We may not always understand what it is God is doing with them and through them. Be careful. Don't weed them out. That's God's job. Our job is to look at ourselves and to see, are we producing fruit? Are we wheat? And if we're not wheat, we're weeds. And what's wonderful about our relationship with God is we can be turned from weeds into wheat. Go back to the scripture. Are you with me? The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth, then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. And he uses the phrase he used last week. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Did you hear the message? Did you understand the explanation? So Jesus tells the story, tells two other stories, sends everyone away, and then explains the story only after being asked. So who's in the story? Well, the owner. The owner is Christ, the king. The, the field is the world. The seed here is not the word. Remember in the other parable, be careful. As we change story to story, the, the things and the people in it may change. In, in the sower, the seed was the word. Here it's the people. It's the people. The enemy is the devil. The harvest, the end of the age, when everything's over. The wicked will be cast into the furnace, but the righteous will shine forth in the kingdom. G. Turp, what's some lessons that I could get out of this? What are some things I probably need to see here in the 21st century? Well, I think it starts here. Satan will follow the Gospels with Gospels and Christians of his own. Notice those things are in quotes. After the coming of the kingdom, there will be some who come behind and sow a new gospel. Not a God gospel. Not a God gospel, but their own. And they will become intertwined, so we must be careful. Where do we find if we're a good seed? Go back to the Word. It will be possible to destroy these. It will not, excuse me, be possible to destroy these without other disruptions. When you rip that out sometime, you may rip out the good. Be careful but they will finally be destroyed at judgment. You know whose job it is to judge? It is God's. Now, I'm not talking about righteous judgment in your own life where you need to look at your life and lay it beside. Ah, are you a parable? Is your life a parable? If I lay your side beside the word, can I say your word is, your life is like the word? It's like the word. Well, is it? Is it? Can we do that? Though believers often seem to get lost in the confusion, there will be a time they will shine. Guys, there will be a time when all will be judged and all will be sorted out and God will take care of that. So let's look at the kingdom for a moment. Some things we learn. The kingdom is universal. The kingdom is universal. It, it's for everybody. The problem is some people will choose not to be a part of it. They will stay tares and weeds their whole life. We have to give them the ability and the opportunity to become more. That's why Jesus died on the cross. That's why you, this morning, can worship and remember him because he gave you the opportunity to be something else. The second thing is, there are pretenders in the kingdom. What did it say? someone might not be able to recognize the difference between wheat and weeds. And there may be people who, who are right here in the midst of the kingdom who they are pretending to be wheat. How will they be known? By their fruit. 
We, weeds don't produce wheat. Wheat produces wheat. The problem is sometimes those weeds, they're going to choke out. Their roots are going to take out the nutrients from someone else. What about a new believer who comes in? Somebody who's, who's reading their Bible and they become a Christian and, and they wind up with a group of pretenders in the kingdom instead of a group of producers in the kingdom. It's very possible they become disillusioned. It's very possible. It's very possible that, that because of that hypocrisy of the tares, that are there, they're in the kingdom, right, right, right. They're, they're right alongside it. It's hard to tell the difference between the two, that their faith all of a sudden becomes diminished or they become disillusioned. Guys, we've got to remember the church is not the perfect place. It's not the perfect place. It's people trying to become perfected because of the blood of Jesus Christ. All of us at times have sat in our little rows, our pews, right? And there have been times that we have sat there and we have probably been pretenders. Yeah, we've probably been pretending. We were, we were going through the motions that day. We kind of sang the songs. We kind of listened to the prayer, right? We, 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 the sermon was there. Maybe we remember something for it. Maybe we did Maybe it didn't affect us at all. They're going to be pretenders in the kingdom. It's very possible that some of you may be pretending instead of being participating. I always say, did you come to worship or did you just come to attend, right? And here's what Jesus tells us. No one escapes judgment. No one. When all the things come out of the ground, when all the people, remember in this case, the seeds are people, when they all, they have one place to go or the other. That's very consistent with other things Jesus will teach. He talks about dividing what? The sheep from the goats. He talks about dividing the wheat from the weeds. The weeds burned. The wheat gathered for glory. Well, I told you, parables are a little different, right? We, we learn from them. What I think a lot of us have done is heard a sermon where there was the story of the wheat and the weeds, or the, or the parable of the wheat and the tares, and immediately we jumped to the explanation. There were two parables in between. Did you notice that? And Jesus says nothing about them. The disciples don't ask about those two. So, what is the structure to what we're looking at? Well, in the story of the sower at the beginning, of it was about planting. Did you, did you catch that? In this one, it was about planting, growing, and harvesting. All three parts were there. The mustard seed was about growth, what it could become. And the leaven was about growth, how it affects the whole bowl of bread, right? How's that little bit of leaven? What does it do? And I think there's two sides of that. Leaven can be good and affect, or leaven could be bad and affect. Jesus sometimes says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, the teachings of the Pharisees. But sometimes a little leaven can change the whole bunch. That, that's what, So are you good seed? Or are you good growth? Uh, is your faith like a mustard seed that has grown over time so that other birds of the air could rest in it? Do people find you a place of, of strength and comfort and solace? Are you still just a tiny little plant that we can't tell what you're going to become yet because you're not growing? So let's look at our summary. The sower. There are various responsible responses to the gospel. We keep sowing. We'll see how it comes out. The weeds, there are false gospels out there. There are people teaching things that are not of God. There are people living things that are not of God, but they're all in the same field. Things can grow. You can grow. The church can grow. The kingdom can grow. And there can be growth in error in the church. And there can be growth in faith in the church. Now, he doesn't say which way, you know, the, the leaven here, be, be careful, it, it leavens the whole bunch. You can affect the whole bunch. Have you ever had that person come into work and, and their attitude has changed everybody else's that day? Well, let's go back to our little chart. Does he tell the parable of the sower? Yes. Does he interpret it? Yes. To the disciples. 
Does he tell the story of the wheat and the weeds? Yes. Does he interpret it after two more stories and only when the disciples ask? Does he tell the story of the mustard seed? Yes. Does he interpret it? Nope. He just tells it. You probably would have to know a little bit about what that is, right? Does he tell the story of the leaven? Yes. Does he interpret it? Nope. He does not. Remember, most of what we know about those two are where we've taken and extrapolated out the meaning, what we think it means. I do know Jesus is explained, and remember, in parables, just because he uses some of the same words doesn't mean they have the same meaning. Look at the difference between seeds in the story of the sower, it's the word, and seeds in the wheat and the wheat, it's the people. So I hope you slowed down your parable reading a little bit. I hope you've thought about your part in the kingdom. I, th I hope this morning you've thought about whether you're wheat or tares, because there is a coming judgment. Next week, we're going to look at treasure, pearl, and a dragnet. Keep this little chart. It's there on your worksheet. I want you to read ahead. Maybe you did last week. I just didn't get that far this week. Does Jesus tell the story? And does he explain the story? Which one? I hope you'll come prepared. Well, our time has come to a close again this week. It's been good to visit with everybody and to see everybody. I hope that in the future we can all be in the same place again uh, and that we can spend our time uh, in a classroom. Uh, maybe you've had some questions about parables or you've wanted to know more about the things that are going on. Um, if you do, many of you know how to contact me. Uh, when we get back together, save up your questions and I'll try to handle those. I hope you've had a good day. Uh, have a blessed day. Spend some time in the Word. Uh, as I've said every week, wash your hands, but make sure your heart is clean. And think about what is the story Jesus is trying to tell. I'll see you next week as we do Kingdom Parables, Part 3.